Wesley's historic questions were about what to teach, how to teach, and what to do. For this interval of features for the Connectional Tables Emerging Forum, we will seek to update these questions for our current moment. We will invite energetic conversation that will illumine our identity, which is tied to what and how we teach, our preferred actions, what we do, and our abiding hopes as we envision the future United Methodist Church. Our intent is to generate passion and energy for conversations that help us walk forward together. Today, I am joined by Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey, President of the Council of Bishops and the Bishop of the Louisiana Episcopal Area. Good morning, Bishop Fierro Harvey. Good morning, good morning. It's good to be with you. We're gonna begin um, kind of just with a conversation about who we are as a, um, as a denomination. We sometimes struggle to define our identity. So mm -hmm. what would you describe as the preoccupations and passions that people would see as the mark of a contemporary United Methodist? What I would like people to see about our identity or about our experience, what people would experience about who we are, uh, because I don't think we're fully there. I don't think we're fully there. Um, obviously, the things for me that mark um, being a United Methodist, and I haven't been a United Methodist all my life, so I can think about the things that brought me to the United Methodist Church. Um, an open table, uh, grace, grace upon grace, um, and, and the openness. You know, I, I grew up Roman Catholic, and so those, the open table, um, the openness, the allowing me to be me, uh, to be a female leader in the church, obviously was an important thing that brought me to the church. So I, I see those as foundational about who we are. Now we say that, and I'm not sure we always mean it, uh, but uh, I do hope that even in the tension and even in those struggles, when when we we say it, that we can ex people can experience it um, more so than not and that we can live out of that identity of openness, of an open table. And I'm not just talking about a communion table, while well, that's important, uh, but an openness to be at the table. We'll say more about that. Of course, the, the image that came immediately to mind for me was the communion table. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it mean in a denomination uh, that at least in the U.S. already struggles with diversity, right. perhaps in some way, uh, that you might not have a diversity of people coming to the communion table uh, in a local church. What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, I think about, uh, and I wrote about this, uh, about my childhood uh, Thanksgiving table that to me was like a communion table. Uh, it was sacramental in many ways. And it wasn't just about the food. It was about um, the hospitality, the openness to gather at table. And yes, when we talk about open table, the first image we have is the communion table and rightfully so. But at our table, we had all kinds of folk gathered, you know, uh, people who uh, sometimes I didn't know who they were. Uh, recently, my brother shared a photograph. It's like, who is that in that family photo? And we know it's not a family member, you know, um, but we knew that when we took the family photo, everybody would be in the photo if you were there. Um, so there were strangers at this table. There were people who didn't like each other at this table. There were people who loved each other at this table. And so to me, that's, um, that broadens my perspective of what an open table looks like. And when we talk about the global nature of this church that we're in and the diversity that we have, for me to even be at some of these tables, um, I often look around and I'm thinking, gosh, how did I get here? Um, the, the privilege of being at these tables. And I also understand that not everybody has that same privilege, right? Um, and so I, I don't take that lightly. 
I, I take that with an, a lot of responsibility being being female, uh, being uh, Hispanic, Latina, uh, all of those things. I, I don't take those things lightly that I am at the table with some responsibility. So um, I just think that for us, uh, and let me just tell you one quick little anecdotal story. Um, in a church that I served, um, I'll never forget this, and I'm not gonna name names, but I do know the names and I can see the faces. Um, serving communion and serving one of the most conservative women I knew in the church. Brushing up shoulder to shoulder with a dear friend who was gay and suffered from HIV AIDS. And they were shoulder to shoulder at the communion table. And I, that image, I, 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 can, I can never unsee that. And I'm so glad. Uh, I, I will never be able to unsee what that looked like at the table. And you know, when you're serving communion, often at the communion rail, you're going down. And, and I got to these two and, and I thought, oh my gosh, this, this is an image of what I would like our church to be like. And that was years and years and years ago. So when I talk, think about identity, when we talk about identity, that, that image just keeps coming to my mind of being at the table, serving these two people shoulder to shoulder at the same table, same communion bread, same cup, and here they are, shoulder to shoulder. To me, that's that's an identity perhaps that I long for um, in the United Methodist Church. So uh, what speaks to you in terms of the historic identity of United Methodists and United Methodism that gets us to that place? What is it in, the, in our core beliefs or our core theology that would get us to that place of uh, this gay person suffering with HIV and this very conservative Christian at the same altar, at the same table, drinking from the same communion cup pre-COVID. You know, one of the places I go back to is the theological task uh, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline. We are a vital web of interactive relationships. That phrase, a vital web of interactive relationships, um, there is that, you know, we call it connection sometimes. Um, but to me, that statement of a vital web, that means that I can't live in this web without you. It is, you know, it is vital that we're in this, in this web um, together. And sometimes it looks more like a hairball than it does a web, right? Um, but it is a vital web of interactive relationships. I cannot live without you. And I think for me, that's the image at the table. Uh, I think that's sort of baked into my DNA, um, frankly. Uh, but, you know, I just, the, that, that phrase of a vital web of interactive relationships. And every once in a while, I just go back and read that theological task. And I just go back and really read through that and reflect on some of those words. We are a vital web of interactive relationships. And that's what helps us be at that table together. We're all different, but we're not complete until we're together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a beautiful image. So let's go forward then. So the U.S., we've just gone through a very polarizing election. Uh, ideologically, there's lots of polarization, especially in the United States. Um, how do we get to a place uh, of connectionalism? Sort of, certainly, not, I'm not talking about um, sameness, mm -hmm. but how do we deal with uh, our diversity uh, within the context of our connection and welcome right. that diversity. Right. Um, you know, I, I've always said, and certainly over the last couple of years, I've talked a lot about the big tent church um, of can we live in the tension? Uh, can we live out of that, that center and can we broaden our center? Um, my hope every day is that that center can be broadened more and more because I really do think that that's where most of us live. Um, but I also recognize that there are people that can't live there. <laughs> um, and there is there some way that we can continue to honor and bless um, those who can't 
I don't, I don't know how to say that any, any better uh, at the moment, but I want to articulate it in a way that, that rather than um, tearing one another apart, can, can we just say, look, uh, I, I, I know you can't live in my center, right? Your center is different than mine. And that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um, in the words of my friend Bishop Palmer, there are no bad people. Uh, it's just, you, you have a different perspective on this. Um, I have dearest, dearest, dearest friends who stand on the total opposite place politically than I do. I don't love them any less. Uh, I hope they don't love me any less. Um, and I think that there's just something that, that right now we're living in this culture where um, all we have to say is like bad stuff about each other, rather than saying, look, you know, I don't agree with you. I don't know that I ever will, but I love you. And let's find a way that we, we can express that love for one another. And that might be together and that might be separated, but that's still okay. And, and, and it's sort of blessing and sending, um, it, you know, we, and I was on the mediation team. We talked a lot about, you know, how do you bless and send? I, I'd love the perfect world would be that, you know, we could all live in this church together uh, and honor one another's differences. I, I'm, I'm slowly beginning to realize that not everybody can do that. Um, and so if you can't, then how do we bless one another and in the process and stop tearing one another apart. I just, that is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, I just can't, I, I just can't stand being in in that rhetoric and in, in the sort of beating each other up from opposite sides of the room. Doesn't help anybody. Um, so can we come together at some point and you know, that whole agree to disagree, oh, yeah, maybe there is something to that. Um, you talk about living in the tension mm -hmm. and certainly with the delays in general conference that have already happened, uh, we are in that tension. Um, so as you think about, you know, living in the tension, what are the things that ground you um, mm -hmm. when you are trying to live in the tension of everything is not resolved, everything is not mm -hmm. figured out, we, may, we, we might not even know how to figure it out. How do you live in that tension of the in-between? Yeah, uh, the already, not yet, all of that kind of stuff that we learned in seminary, right? Um, it, it's a hard place. Uh, it is because you feel like you're being torn torn to shreds uh, sometimes uh, in the process. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny that in this time, I've gone back and pulled things off my bookshelf that um, I read a long time ago. <laughs> Um, and I was cleaning up some books and it's like, you know, here's Brueggemann's prophetic imagination. Let me pull that out and, and read it again. Let me, it, you know, I went back to read Gil Rendell's Back to Zero. It, there's a lot of that that I just pulled out again. Um, how do I live uh, faithfully? Um, how do I live with integrity in this time of tension? And how do I not get sucked into it? You know, um, I think that's also going back to your previous question about the polarization. It's so easy to get sucked into it. Uh, and so how do I keep myself outside of that? Richard Rohr talks about leading from the edge of the inside. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I just want to, I want to be out there leading from the edge um, and looking in versus trying to be in the center looking out. Uh, and I just think our best, sometimes our best teaching comes from the margins. Um, maybe living, having grown up, grown up in the margins, and maybe again, my own personal experience um, helps me in understanding that. But um, I think when we're living in the tension, if you get too much in the center, all you see is, is your center. Uh, whereas if you are leading from the edge of the, you know, the edge of the outside here, it's can I look into it uh, versus out from it. Um, so, you know, just, I, I, I go back again. I said to uh, some of the things that, that really have been foundational for me, I've gone back to a lot of freedmen and family systems and uh, because we're broken. I mean, that, there's just no other way to, 
to say it, but it's not only United Methodists that are broken, the world is kind of broken. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's part of being a prophet uh, that we're called to here is, you know, do we have enough imagination, prophetic imagination, as again, borrowing from Brueggemann, um, to lead our people in a new way? Um, one of the things, I forgot who said it, that creativity is birthed in the tension. Um, so mm -hmm. could we, you know, in this time where who knows what's on either end of this, Susan Beaumont talks about it being liminal, being at a threshold, um, nothing in our rear view mirror, you know, it's like I look in my rear view mirror and it's like nothing in front of me looks very familiar, right? Uh, it looks like nothing in my rear view mirror. So how do I, how do I get creative? How do I sort of build in this time versus I could just pull the covers over my head. Um, and in some kind of weird way, I find this time kind of exciting. Hmm. Um, because I think that uh, we, we're at a place where we might have an opportunity that we've never had before to be creative, to be imaginative. Uh, and so it's like, okay, that, that's kind of exciting to me that, to look into the future. One of my um, strength finders, my number one strength is futurist. Uh, so I think that uh, I, I always have my eye in, in the future. So what, what, what is it that I can do in this time to help lead us there versus getting stuck here? and not doing anything. I mean, because that's that's the that's the danger here. You can pull the covers over your head and do nothing. Uh, and, and frankly, I will just say that there are days where pulling the covers over your head might be the best thing you can do. Uh, it's okay. But um, I, I do think that, that we have an opportunity here to, to use this time very differently, um, to, to sort of be imaginative, to be creative, and hopefully be a little prophetic in the midst of uh, COVID and uh, the pandemic of racism and the natural disasters that are going on around us, it, it, you know, taking care of ourselves sometimes means putting your head a little bit under the covers. But when you come out, uh, have you thought about what does the church need to do differently to be vital, effective, relevant in the world that is taking shape around us right now? I would say for me uh, is listen. Listen to what the world is telling us, um, and and how and use this time. Um, I think that you know. I will just say that during this COVID time, um, especially, life's gotten a little simpler, right? Um, you know, in the beginning of COVID, uh, people went back to riding bicycles. Uh, we went on our morning walks here. Life got simpler. Uh, got to meet my neighbors, uh, see who they were, people I had never met. Um, you know, met the dogs in the neighborhood, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I think maybe it's been kind of good for us. Um, so in this time, you know, did you try to buy yeast? Early on, you couldn't buy yeast. Uh, you couldn't buy a bike. Um, so I think maybe making life much more simple um, and understanding that if we listen to one another um, and listen to the stuff around us um, you know I, I live in southwest Louisiana or South Louisiana Southwest Louisiana got battered by two hurricanes one after another that we had a third. You had a pandemic, racial unrest, and then three hurricanes. You know, it, it, it all gets kind of crazy really fast. But what I learned is as I listened to these people, uh, particularly in the Lake Charles area, um, they were resilient. You know, um, they were faithful. Uh, they brought me to tears um, more, than, uh, more than once. Um, and so I, I, I think about, um, could we could we use this time as a Sabbath? Uh, could we listen carefully, like even listen to nature? Um, you know, I, it's like I've noticed things I never noticed before. It's like I'm sure that magnolia tree blooms every year. 
um, but I just noticed it this year. Uh, so if we're going to be vital again, um, how do we listen? How do we learn from one another right now? How do we leverage what we're learning in this experience um, to, to move forward in a different way? And, you know, every, all the rules kind of, it's like, you know, worship, no worship, online, in person, mask, no mask, all of those things. I, I just think we, um, if we just get down to the basics of blocking and tackling, as they say, of what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus, um, can I listen um, deeply uh, to the people around me, to the nat to nature? Um, so if there's one thing I would say is listen. And, and I'll say that I'm having, I, I have to work on this myself. It's not something that comes you know, easily to many of us, right? Is to listen deeply. Uh, but if we're gonna be vital again, we really got to listen to one another. And maybe in this time that we've had for the last nine months, what have we learned? What have we learned about just sort of the basics of how we uh, relate and come together? Who would you listen to who you think has not been heard in our denomination? Because you, you talked a little bit about margins, leading from the center of the margins, hearing the voices on the margins. Um, who do you think you would listen to in particular? And, and I know it would be everyone in, in reality, but are there voices that have not been heard that uh, need particular attention in terms of listening? Yeah, um, yes. I mean, I, I really do think, uh, I think often um, as I follow my friends down in, for example, in South Texas, um, you know, we, the, the cope, the, the, COVID is just rampant in some of those areas. Uh, El Paso is, you know, off the charts. Um, we haven't, you know, the Native American uh, community is suffering greatly. We haven't really heard, and, and, and I'll take some responsibility for that. Um, I think that there are people we have just not tuned our ear to. We might have heard them, but I'm not sure we have listened and really tune our ear and it's always the people on the margins and and one of the things i've learned living in south louisiana in a disaster zone is that in a disaster and i would call this time being sort of in a disaster is that the marginalized just get more marginalized right so people of color um it's like their life is on the edge uh it, and some of these folks were living on the edge long before a pandemic and now here we are i'm so thankful for doctors and nurses and physical therapists and all of those people who have been incredibly um tax and essential um but i also think about the person in the food service uh, or the laundry and um you know just i i i, I I think we need to listen uh, for that. And I think we've gotten a little bit of a glimpse of that when, uh, but it, it's on television, <laughs> you know, it's on social media. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know. Um, you know, when I don't have to worry about whether my child got fed lunch, um, but I know that there are people who do. I know there are people who do. You're also, you're the uh, president of the Council of Bishops. Uh, but you're also a leader in Episcopal area. Yeah. And um, what do you what what do you think about the ministry of annual conferences right now? We talk a lot about the general church and ministry on the general church level. What is essential about the the role of annual conferences? Yeah, I live with a foot two worlds in many ways, uh, and one certainly does affect the other. That's back to the vital web of interactive relationships, right? Um, but, you know, the annual conference is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, actually, the local church is where the rubber hits the road. We talk about the separation of the church and we talk about, you know, budgets and all of that. What we it's like, OK, the only reason we have a, a denominational budget is because somebody sat in a pew or a virtual worship service and wrote a check and somebody maybe even from their Social Security check 
wrote a check for $10 and sent it to their local church. That is the only reason that that we exist, right? You know, the only that's what turns the lights on. So um, I think that that's sort of that connection back. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we forget that the general church stuff is only possible because somebody somewhere sat in a pew or in front of a computer or whatever. And now the fact that people aren't showing up to sit in a pew, um, these churches are struggling. Um, and I will just say, um, for me, the, um, I've got a great concern for the local church and I have deeper concerns for our clergy. Um, our clergy have, you know, went from, you know, uh, online or from in-person worship to being tele-evangelists in about a three-day period of time. Um, and every day has been different. Uh, and just when they think they've got it figured out, something else changes, right? I, I, I worry for their spiritual, mental, physical health. Uh, because they're constantly having to pivot and and then they're they're up against you know the person that says you know it's my god-given right not to wear a mask or it's my god-given right to show up for worship and so they're dealing with that every single day and for every letter i get in my inbox that's somebody sitting in somebody's pew right and so these clergy are um i think uh, i i they're they're just being pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled and i worry greatly uh, for them and so when we talk about um, impact of these folks in the local churches the vitality of a local church the pressures of a pastor these days nothing can either nothing you and i ever with the seminary for prepares us for for this is just a whole different ball game today than, than for me it was you know, 10 years ago in the church or 15 years ago, uh, certainly as a bishop. What I did eight years ago and what I'm doing today um, in my area are completely different. So I think that, that we, you know, it's like, we've got to cut each other a little bit of slack here, uh, extend that grace because I think our pastors are under a lot of pressure. And some of it is denominational pressure. Some of it is local pressure. Uh, and, you know, it, they live on eggshells, they walk on eggshells um, of, you know, if I say this, I'm going to offend this person. If I don't say it, I'm going to offend that person. Um, and, you know, they're going to take their, you know, their marbles and go home. And uh, it, that's just, it is a hard, hard time to be a pastor of a local church. And I don't think we can, we cannot not that we cannot forget that uh is pastoring a church today is so very different so very different than um i know that it was for me and it was for people even you know 10 years ago five years ago last year <laughs> yeah. there's not as much respect for the profession the denomination is struggling in terms of uh you know uh vitality I mean that's been the expectations on pastors are high and pastors are trying to uh, navigate a pandemic uh, and keep themselves and their families healthy in addition yeah. to all, making decisions about whether to have worship would you know all of these things and I think that um, you know laity are in the same boat you know a lot of them have lost their jobs um, or family members have lost their jobs. They're they're having to you know teach their children at home too. Uh, they're they're struggling as well. So it's it's not nobody's better off than the other. You know this is a so this is but kind of been an equal opportunity time for all you know disasters for all of us. But um, you know I just think that that laity are also struggling and 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 I think what happens too is when we're stressed. Um, we say and do things that we wouldn't if we weren't. <laughs> and that's where, um, you know, I, I think where we, you know, back to your polarization uh, question much earlier, that um, I think we're, this, the system is stressed. And so when the system is stressed, it makes us do and say things that we would never do and say. Well, you mentioned stress, and certainly mm -hmm. here in the United States, there's societal stress. And, um, 
over the last several months, you know, we've had the very high uh, profile uh, killings of African-American people, uh, George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor. Can you say uh, something about that in terms of mm -hmm. how does the church um, begin to address racism? Where are we with that? Where are we going? Um, you know, first of all, I think we've got to repent for our sins of the past. Um, you know, the church is not immune uh, to our our racism that, that's been baked into who we are. Um, so I, I, I just have to be up front and say that right up front. Um, and I think that for some people, it you can take giant steps and for some of us, it can just be baby steps. And, um, and, and both equally important depending on the context. Uh, again, I live in the South and I live in Louisiana where racism is you know, alive and well. And um, I, uh, we've done these wonderful, uh, we did these modules, we did about four modules of you know, anti-racism, you know, white fragility. Uh, and, and it was, we had you know, several hundred or about a hundred or so people, it wasn't a mandatory thing, participate. And I thought, you know, for the first time, some of us used the words white fragility and white privilege uh, and, and race and called it for what it was. Um, so if we, we took baby steps. Are we there? No. Um, will we get there? You know, I pray. Uh, but I think that we, the church, if not the church, then, you know, who else? <laughs> uh, I can't leave it to somebody else. And so um, we've, I think we're, we're starting to address this in ways with the dismantling racism campaign. You know, when you dismantle something, something you've got to do it one piece at a time. Um, if you tear down the whole thing, <clears throat> it, 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 uh, it could be tragic. So I think dismantling this one piece at a time might just be what, what we can commit to doing right now, but we've got to commit to moving forward and being a voice. Um, you know, as United Methodists, um, like I said, we, we have a, a sordid past uh, when it comes to racist issues, but uh, I think it's time for us to, to really move forward and take a step that perhaps others aren't courageous enough to take. And, and we've got to be courageous. Uh, that's what it's going to take. Um, so for us to be able to say Black lives do matter, uh, that's courageous for, for some people that have never used those words before. And so I, I'm going to celebrate every small victory. And those large victories, we will celebrate as well. But for some people, it's got to be baby steps. For some people, it's giant leaps. And it's, it, we've got to all start moving some direction or we're gonna be here again. And what I don't wanna do is wait till the next George Floyd for all of us to rally up again. Um, you know, we, our memories are, are short. Uh, we almost have racial amnesia sometimes. And so I, I wanna make sure that this stays in front of people and that we continue to speak, uh, speak truth into this and claim it and, as our, um, as our responsibility as as United Methodists, but also as just faithful followers of Jesus. This is this is what we have as our priority right now. Yeah. So you, you you talk about, I mean, in the course of this conversation, you've talked about um, vision. You've mm -hmm. talked about uh, learning how to listen in a way that uh, where our ears are attuned uh, to people on the margin. You've talked about dismantling racism. Uh, you've mm -hmm. talked about what what brings relevancy to the local church. All of this that is before us, what kind of leadership do you mm -hmm. imagine emerging in the future to address these kinds of challenges? A prophetic, courageous, resilient, um, I think those, you know, if I had to kind of pick some watch words, uh, those would be words that I would um, would use because I think that uh, status quo is just not going to it's not going to do it. Um, and innovation, creativity, but resilience to me is, you know, can we live out of this? Um, this period of time as a nation, as the world, uh, in a way that, that we say, you know, we are resilient people because we are 
followers of Jesus. Uh, and I, um, you know, so for me, those are three words that I would use prophetic, um, resilient, courageous, you know, being imaginative. I think that that's, I, I see that that's required of me right now. Uh, sometimes doing the unpopular um, and the things that maybe not everybody is going to like, um, but important for me to say, you know, I'm, this is the place where I'm going to take the stand and I'm willing to take the heat for it. One of the things we recently learned from Susan Beaumont in our Council of Bishops meeting is that uh, change often comes with heat or heat, you know, heat causes change. You know, you can't, pota you know, potatoes without boiling are yucky. Um, and so sometimes the little heat is what we need to cause some change. Now, you know, some of us are saying, wait a minute, I'm boiling down here. <laughs> you know, um, I get that. Uh, there's a, more heat than most of us really want to have at, on most days right now. But out of this heat, can we can we be courageous enough, um, resilient enough to withstand some of the heat to create something something new? That's what being maybe prophetic means right now. You can't be prophetic without courage, right. and um, and I think that the piece around resilience there has to also be. Uh, some trust in the resilience of the church and some trust in the resilience of our people that um, change can come and, and the church is not going to break. Right, um, right. When you, uh, you know, we talk about spiritual leadership and obviously the episcopacy is, uh, you know, as, as bishop, you are a general superintendent for the church. Uh, what kind of leadership uh, within the episcopacy, do you imagine emerging, and or what style of leadership, or which direction in terms of leadership, and then what what is gained or lost uh, uh, by the proposal to uh, declare a moratorium on electing new bishops? Right. Well, back to courageous, resilient, prophetic. Um, I think that's what's needed. Uh, and then what's gained? Um, and I, I preferred not to use the word moratorium here, uh, but perhaps limited uh, elections um, or no new, you know, we, the Council of Bishops has, has really been, it was agreed upon that uh, we supported sort of the grassroots efforts by some to not elect bishops uh, this in 21. Um, I think if, if I were to say, for me, the, it, what the gain is, and there, there's some losses, there's some losses, clearly, losses of no new leadership, those sorts of things, but we've got to deal with some realities right now. Um, and if we are to wait, uh, the dust will settle, right? Uh, it allows us to catch up with ourselves, mostly. And uh, I think that we can make a better decision in three years than we could make in 21 at a jurisdictional conference. We would have, we would know um, if the church is separating, we would know who's staying, who's going. We would have some clearer understanding of, of who we are, back to your original question about identity, right? We would have a clear understanding of who we are and the kind of leaders that we needed. And so I think we would, we're, we're just better, better positioned to make a better decision in 24 or 25, if we end up changing the quadrennial cycle, but in 24, let's say. Uh, and and in, that's a three year time that we can truly look at where we are, who we are, and what we need as far as leaders are concerned for our future. I, I think that is, that is a big gain. That is a huge gain. So to me, yes, it's a financial, decision right that there is we that's a reality it's a financial reality but the more strategic uh reason for me is understanding again who we are where we are and what we need things settle uh, and it's going to take probably more than three years but we'll know a little bit more in 24 than we do now and so i think it would allow us to make good decisions about Episcopal leadership 
It will help us make good decisions about where we need what kind of leadership. Uh, and, and I just, I think we would be hasty in many ways to go ahead and make an election of a bishop now rather than the future. Now, I recognize not everybody will, will agree with that, but for me, I I just, in, you know, just in deep in my soul and my gut uh, is that I really believe we will have the capacity to make a better decision in 24 than we would in 21. We would know more than we do now. Thank you so much for joining us. I very much appreciate your time. Thank you for yours. Appreciate you a lot. Thanks.